Why would anyone want to wage a war on merit? Right, because it's not fair. Because merit it's not, isn't fair. Merit is not fair. So what is fair? Fair is everybody having the same outcome. We have in, in the U.S. We have these like gifted and talented schools, mm -hmm. and they're trying to limit how many Asian kids get to go because there's just too many. So what is the state of education at the moment? In public and private, it is pretty dire. Uh, the woke have marched through our institutions and they have taken over schools at pretty much every level. You see this also with pornography in school libraries. That's become a huge thing. What do you, what do you mean? Oh, oh, what? Oh, yeah, no, what no. What do you mean pornography in pornography school libraries? Pornography in school libraries has become a giant thing in the US because- What, what do you mean? This breaks every single safeguarding guideline that I have yes. ever heard. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry on the road from the USA. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is the co-author of this book, Stolen Youth, Carol Marcus. Welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks, guys. Nice uh, to be here. It is great to have you here. And by the way, thank you to our locals for lending us the studio in Miami so we could do this. This, was, this is great. Um, Listen, uh, the same question as, as we always ask all our guests is, who are you? What's been your journey through life? How do you find yourself sitting here talking to us? I'm a columnist at the New York Post for over a decade, and I also write for a lot of other places. Um, and I moved to Florida, which is where we are, about a year ago, very publicly, uh, because I had been a lifelong New York supremacist and <laughs> really always defended New York City against all slights, you know, real and perceived. And about a year and a, a year and a bit ago, um, my, our family decided that we had had enough. The schools had been closed. The masks had been on kids for too long. The wokeness had overrun everything. Uh, reality had ceased to exist for a lot of our neighbors, and we had to get out. So that is how we're sitting here in. Florida today, and the book is uh, an outgrowth of that as well. Yeah, uh, and before that, y uh, your family moved here from the Soviet Union. That's right. We were thinking about doing this interview in Russian, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know, I thought that might be not. not My Russian not cool wasn't going right to be now. good enough. Francis was fine. I was going <laughs> to yeah. struggle. Yeah, it's also I iffy time to be Russian. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. So I I've been reading the book. I find it very interesting. Uh, this is a moment every trigonometry viewer and listener is going to drink because I'm a former teacher and I was reading about what's happening in education in the United States. It sounds terrifying to put it mildly. So what is the state of education at the moment in public schools in the US? In public and private, it is pretty dire. Mm. Uh, the woke have marched through our institutions and they have taken over schools at pretty much every level. Um, the, it begins in teachers' colleges where the teachers themselves are indoctrinated into leftist philosophy. They use Marxist books to teach the teachers. A lot of times the teachers don't even know that they're being indoctrinated. And then these teachers disperse throughout the country and end up arguing things like math is racist. And this is reality that's happening in schools across the country. And I, I do note that it is public and private because... I think one of the main solutions to all of this in America has been school choice, where you get the portion of the funding that would have gone to educate your child in a public school, you could take that funding and go to private or parochial or et cetera. Um, the issue with that is that it's very hard to find private and parochial schools that are also not woke. It's a minority of schools across the country that haven't been ideologically captured. Carol, if I'm listening to this, I'm not someone who is clued up on all this, what, what, I don't yeah. even know what woke means. It almost sounds like a bit of a parody. You know, the, the woke people have taken over the institutions, they've brainwashed the teachers. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the subtitle to the book is how radicals are raising innocence and indoctrinating children. What's actually, if I'm a parent, I don't care about the stuff, I've got a job. What, what What's going on in the school yeah. that I should care about? So that used to be me, you know, I think before writing this book, I would have said that a lot of this stuff sounds like a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I thought that I was going to find what we found while writing this. I am a very optimistic, everybody kind of wants the best for everyone. And come on, you know, obviously they're not teaching Marxism at teachers' colleges. That's crazy, Constantine. So, you know, it ends up being 
something that's very hard to convince people. Um, and I would have been one of those people had I not seen what I saw in writing this book. So what I say to parents is, you know something questionable is going on. You might not have a label for it. it might, you might not call it woke. Woke is to me when leftism meets a forced conformity. That's how I describe wokeism. Um, so the old leftism might, sure, they might indoctrinate your kids or try to. They might uh, try to put in information that is really one-sided into curriculums, yes. But the new wokeism does that and also does not allow stepping outside of the lines whatsoever. They do not allow other opinions. They do not allow other influences or considerations. So while the old leftist teacher might, you know, paint a picture, let's say, of America as being this, like, terrible place where we just, you know, slaughtered the Native Americans and stole all their land and we have nothing positive about us at all, um, they'll sometimes, they'll, they would often present the opposite opinion as well. Now it's like, this is what we believe. We believe this now. And what I say often also is that liberals are hardest hit by this. It's not really conservatives like me. I don't really care what they say. And I could brush it off and that's it. But for liberals, they've gotten to where they're very scared to speak. And their liberal teachers are very scared to speak. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to be ostracized by their um, tribe. And so you have this conformist thinking that is you know has taken over everything. And I think parents recognize it and they might not be able to label it or name it, but they know it's happening. Uh, and the reason I'm, I ask this, because I think th there are quite a few people now who feel this way. Like uh, Dave Rubin had me on his show on this very set yesterday, we recorded it, and we we're talking about will we ever move to America and why and why not, etc. And one of the things I was saying is, you know, the one thing is a children's education that is terrifying because you, you know this as a mother, like you give birth to this little thing and you raise it, you nurture it. Uh, and then, you know, they're, they're not that old when you send them off to be, yep. you know, brainwashed by right. people. Uh, and it is quite scary, I think, for a lot of parents. But I suppose the question is pra on a practical level, what can you tell us about what children in this country are being taught at school that should concern people? So it's interesting. I lived in the UK. I started telling you guys this before the show started, but I lived in Scotland. And the first time I lived in Our Scotland, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I really loved it. And I loved, um, and I moved there because I had just fallen in love with the country. But I moved uh, the first time to study on a commune in Scotland, in the north of Scotland. Open conservative, lived on a commune. All my, you know, flatmates knew who I was and what I believed. And maybe that could still happen in Scotland. I don't know. That cannot happen in America. Not only, forget about the commune, you cannot have flatmates who have different political beliefs than you do currently in the U.S. It just isn't, like, when you have ads for roommates in newspapers, it'll say, you know, no no conservatives or no, you know, Trumpers or no, just no, no not anybody who doesn't believe what we believe. Um, so all of that is is scary to me, that kind of conformity. I don't know if you guys have gotten to there yet in the UK. I don't know that you worry about what your kids are learning in school. But for me, I have now seen something that I can't unsee and I have to battle it at home. I was telling you that my kids watched your Oxford Union speech because to me, I wanted to explain to them why the rest of the world is not, let's say, focusing on climate change the same way that our 18-year-olds are and why that matters. Um, so... At home, we try to really lay the foundation so that when they go out into the world, I'm not as worried about them being ripe for indoctrination. And Carol, what specific things are happening in the classroom that you would say is wrong and teachers shouldn't be teaching? Well, we have so many examples in the book of things that teachers absolutely shouldn't be teaching. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of joke about the whole math is racist, but that's happening. That is actually happening where if you you know, if you, if you believe that two plus two will always equal four, that is a racist construct. And that is... Does that really happen? That in the, is really that happening. That happens in the school. How insane Because I see that? idiots yeah. saying it on Twitter, no, no, but when people real. assert that it's happening oh. in a school, I'm like, is it? Yes, we yeah. trace it to uh, two teachers' colleges. Again, they're learning this. They're, they're learning the idea that two plus two does not always equal four. And if you're adamant that it does, that is a racist construct, a white supremacist construct that you that you believe. Um, so many other things that go beyond, you know, 
th that kind of nonsense, but we keep he hearing stories in the U.S. of kids being transitioned in the classroom behind their parents' backs, where they don't tell the parents that the, that the little girl has decided that she's a little boy, and they give them a new name, and they let the kid bring in other clothes to wear. And we're talking, you know, w when you picture this, you might be picturing like a 16-year-old, mm -hmm. but one of the recent cases was a fourth grader, which in the U.S. is around 9, 10 years old keeps happening. It's not like one story, it's like dozens at this point. Um, and the idea that the teacher can have a secret with your child mm -hmm. is scary and parents should be afraid because maybe your child doesn't have gender dysphoria and worry, you know, thinks that they might be a different gender, but they could have other problems that the teacher is going to keep from you and decide that you're not worth, you know, bringing into the conversation and that should really scare people. And Carol, look, as someone, again, who used to work in that sector, it's surely got to be a minority, hasn't it? Because just from my experiences of teachers in, in a career that spanned, what, 12 to 13 years? Yeah. I can't imagine that many of them behaving in this fashion, if well, I'm honest. Of course but then, it, yeah, of course it's a minority. It couldn't, you know, if we had 50 plus percent of the teachers across the, <laughs> across the country deciding that your kid, you know, might be of a different gender and, and not telling you about it, I think that would be really be a, a bigger problem, mm. but it's happening. And so again, it's it's like it could be one thing, it could be another thing. Um, at our, my kids' school in Brooklyn, um, getting the kids to march for different causes has become standard. They have marched against guns. They have marched against hate, vague hate. Um, <laughs> they have marched obviously uh, for climate change. You know, uh, policies to be altered. And I tell a story in the book where I let my first grader, my middle son, march in this climate march because he, we had just switched schools after, after the school year had started. He was already new and different. Um, and I didn't want to speak up. And I would never, you know, it still bothers me that I didn't say anything because my little seven-year-old marched around with an Earth dies, we die sign. And then he came up with like ideas on helicopters and, and caves and what he can do to like fight climate change and you wanted my first grader on it and now he's on it and you know you could see where this grows into anxiety for kids and that is a, a giant problem. So many kids have issues because they are told that the earth is ending and you are tasked with stopping it little seventh seven year old you know. And it, what I find baffling is I'm, I look at what the, sorry, I look at these things that are happening in classrooms in the United States, and it might be more understandable if your outcomes educationally in this country weren't appalling. Well, that's the whole thing, right? Every minute you spend on woke nonsense is a minute you're not spending on math and science and, you know, history. Uh, that's a big issue to me. Mm. And, you know, being born in the Soviet Union, I think we, I have a very, like, my kids must be very into academics. Like, I do not play. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you got a B minus. We're getting, You're like a Chinese right. mom. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. I love the, you know, Tiger Mom, Amy Chua, Amy Chua but I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not as good at it as she is. Like, I, you know. But yes, I absolutely think academics is so important and I want my kids to be challenged. I want things to be hard for them. I don't want them just skating by, which my kids love to do. Um, I want them to work. And even that is an idea that you're not allowed to have anymore. So in places like San Francisco, they're dumbing down their curriculums because it's not fair to have, let's say, uh, an algebra class where the majority is white. And so because it's not fair, they're getting rid of like algebra for seventh graders altogether. And this is insanity. This is crazy. And the lack, so this, um, I call it like the war on merit, really mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with this wokeness because it's all one thing. It's all like we do it like this and this is how we are going to push equity and this is how it works. And your uh, assertion is that this comes from the teacher training. Well, this part of it, yes, yeah. but it's it has uh, gripped so many different facets of our society. Mm. Schools is just one chapter of the book because so many other ways that wokeness has woven itself into our world. Again, I don't know that things are as bad in the UK yet. When I listen to you, you know, I think that your universities, for sure, are also captured. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that the rest of your society has been taken over quite as much as ours has. And so another example, and the, the one that I find just absolutely scariest in the book, like I think schools, kids, you can, um, you know, education, you could sort of still reverse. You can do stuff at home. You can build a block. But the scariest chapter for me is the medical chapter, mm -hmm. where our medical system has been 
entirely captured by this woke virus. And so, for example, um, every year there's like a conference where the best doctors who deal with premature birth babies uh, get together and they talk about it and they have like the four absolute best who tell you what happened in the last year because things are always changing and, and improving in the field. And so they recently uh, had this conference or in about a year and a half ago maybe and um, they realized that the four best doctors in this field are white men and you can't have that. So now they're going to introduce women and g make sure that the ethnicity spread is, is wider on the stage. But so now you no longer have the best doctors. You have good doctors maybe, um, but you're looking for other things other than best. And that is so scary. And then in order to get into medical schools, you need to write an essay on how you're going to promote diversity and, and the rest in your practice. And it's terrifying. It, to me, that really takes away the ability of a doctor to say what they want to say, investigate what they need to investigate, and really not feel like they are, um, you know, have to conform to some ideas. It's it's such a good point because with a doctor, you don't want them thinking about any of this nonsense. No. You just want them to treat you. That's right. it. Right. And I, the, yeah. And the gender thing comes up in the medical thing too, where the doctor has to pretend that they don't know what gender you are for real, and you know, <laughs> like they have to give you tests that don't apply to you because you know you say that you're this gender and your your birth sex is something different. We also keep coming across that and. So it, it just every minute that is spent on this, people people are going to die. Mm -hmm. This is going to lead to death. We might not know it, we might not see it, but it is going to happen. And of course, because a woman having a heart attack is very different to a male having a heart attack. Uh, absolutely. And the dosage that you have to mm -hmm. give and all the rest of it. And this, I mean, a heart attack is a perfect example because someone's having a heart attack, you don't have a lot of time to then go, right. oh, I wonder what this person with a vagina <laughs> identifies as. <laughs> That's exactly it. And it's it that kind of thing is really terrifying. So my co-author uh, is the homeschooling mom of six. I have three kids. I have two in public, one in private school. And she homeschools her children. She pre-reads the books. She doesn't let them watch any modern television or YouTube or anything. I'm much more permissive. And for me, we kind of lay down the foundation at home. We we really talk about a lot of different things that we wish we weren't didn't have to be talking about on a, on a lot of different levels. But she'll say that no matter how much she opts out of culture, she can't opt out of her pediatrician's office. And so this, no matter how much you want to pull your kids from this insanity, you have to go to the doctor sometimes. And so you might not be interested in woke, you know, but woke is interested in you. And how does this play out against what I think is a very good system? Again, Dave and I talked about this, the federal system, where you, you can do what you've done, which is if you don't like what's happening in the jurisdiction that you live in, you can move somewhere else. Like, yeah. are, are you able in this country as an American to go, well, I don't like this, I am going to move to wherever, and there I can vote for my school district or whatever to be yeah. the way that I want. Is that still possible, or is this yes. like you can't escape it? Yes, that is still possible in some ways, but the medical thing, for example, yeah. that's a national accreditation yeah. society, so it's not a local thing. You can't move to Florida. You might, you just might find more doctors who don't subscribe to this kind of thing and who will do things, you know, in a normal way, even though they've been taught to do it in an abnormal way, you might find more of them in places like Florida. Um, but they have been accredited by the same licensing groups that push this. So, it, and it's it, it's happening on such a wide level that it's, it's tough to find rational, sane doctors. Um, and, you know, like, even in Florida, we sort of have like a whisper network, like, is your doctor normal? Can <laughs> I have him? Like, and that's the, that's how you find your MD even here. I, and I know you left the Soviet Union at a fairly young age, mm -hmm. younger. I, I think you, were, you said you were two, yeah. I was about 11 or 12. But I imagine you still know, you're familiar with the idea of living in a society as w we would have done it, uh, as I certainly did, where your parents had to fight the the authorities yeah. to prevent you from being indoctrinated into an ideology that they thought was wrong or evil, frankly. Right. Right. 
Do you feel that, I, look, whenever you make any comparison mm -hmm, with anything, mm -hmm. people are like, no, you yes, know. Yes. But you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Yeah. Do, do you think we're sort of operating in a similar environment now where if you don't agree with these ideas, you have to work so hard at home as a parent just to prevent the children from being basically ruined by the right. school that they end up going to? So we open with a history chapter in, in Stolen Youth because there, is, there are a lot of parallels to what's happening right now. And I don't know about you, but my whole life, People have said like, oh, doesn't this feel like the Soviet Union? And I would be like, no, not at all. That's not, not even comparable. Like, what are you talking about? Um, but the last three years, the COVID years, have really felt Soviet. And a lot of, in a lot of ways, you know, neighbors informing on each other. Mm. You're not, not allowed to say certain things. You, you must word things in a certain way. The spectacle of it, like the Black Lives Matter and like the defund police in the U.S. Like it wasn't enough to say it. You had to put the sign in the window. You had to really say it. So um, I see a lot of parallels. And so the difference is that my parents would have worried about getting into real trouble if they had tried to tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we, I tell the story of Pavlik in, in the book. Um, and, you know, my mom still does... Pavlik Morozov. Pavlik Morozov, right, yes. Yeah. And uh, he was the... Um, he had told... So we don't know which part of the story is true, is, is what I was going to say about Pavlik. My mom does not know which part of that story is true. We don't really know. It doesn't matter which part of the story is right. true. What matters is this was a story that was held yes. up. He, this guy was a hero. Right. That's what matters. So he was a hero. He had informed on his parents uh, for hoarding grain. And his pa his family Sorry had to killed interrupt. him. So, yeah. how, how, so let's just get the background to the yeah. story for people who don't know. How old was the kid, and when when was this, etc. Et so this et is um, in the Stalin years. He's around ten. Um, he is. Uh, he he tells. And again, did he tell on his parents, or was he randomly murdered? We have no idea because everything there is a lie. But um, he, the story goes, he informed on his parents who had been hoarding grain, mm -hmm. and then his family killed him. And then, in retribution, the state killed. His entire family, his mother, his father, his cousins, his like everybody, everybody, everybody gets killed in the story. The grandparents, I mean, everybody. It's a very Russian story. Yeah, yeah. everybody dies. <laughs> <laughs> and then you call it a comedy, right. like Chekhov. At the uh -huh, beginning. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he becomes pioneer number one, and this is a story that they use to indoctrinate other children. Look, you can be like Pavlik. You can be a boy hero. Um, and who told on his family? Yeah, who told mm -hmm. on his family? Family matters far less than the state does. So. Here's the the perfect example, and you could be a hero or you could be dead in a ditch. Like, which one do you want to be? Um, and so, yeah, I think that a lot of the, you know, I, I'm not saying again that we're at the same place in the Western world that the Soviet Union was, mm -hmm. but we are in danger of it. And I think that a lot of the main thing to me is that in the Soviet Union, in China, in Cambodia, and a lot of places that we write about in the history chapter. They could say, we didn't know. And a lot of it is true. They really didn't know. They didn't know what was true. They didn't know what was real. But we can't say that. And part of that is why we wrote the book. We don't want people to say, oh, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Well, here's, here's what's happening. You have the idea now. And Carol, one of the things that I, I find extraordinarily troubling about the moment that we're in is I, I'm not saying we ever got to the goal because we didn't. But the aspiration for my generation and probably, you know, people older than me as well was we were in the West, we're trying to get to a society where your race didn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we got there. There was still racist assholes around when I was yeah. growing up and mm -hmm. still are. But that was the dream. That was the goal. That right. was the vision. We got that from Martin Luther King onwards. And it was mm -hmm. universally embraced as the way that a multi-ethnic society like the ones that we live in should move forward. And now, I think it's fair to say that w the woke ideology has the opposite view. Race matters a lot to people. So what do you, how do you talk to, to your kids about yeah. that? Like, <laughs> if all they see from the outside is race, 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 race really matters, how do you, how do you teach them about it? How do you talk to them about we it? We try to have really honest conversations with them. And that's the thing. Parents are so awkward and they're so afraid of saying the wrong thing to their own kids. I'm not afraid of that. I, and I, and neither is my husband. I think we, we talk to our kids about how much character matters and how the color of somebody's skin is, you know, irrelevant. Um, and so many different ways that we try to bring home the idea that you, you're not going to be colorblind. It's, it doesn't mean that you're not, you don't you don't see race. Of course, you see race, but you treat everybody the same, and you don't you know treat anybody differently because of their race in a positive or a negative way. 
Um, and I think it's crazy that we've moved away from that. That used to be, you know, it was, it was the gold standard of it. I mean, again, you're right, we didn't get there. I'm not saying that we, we lived in some like racism free society. That's ridiculous. But we were heading towards something better, and now we're heading towards something far worse. What, what are we heading towards, Carol? We're heading towards race being the absolute number one most important thing about you. And, you know, What's interesting about that is it's happening to white people too. So it, it, it is leading to an increase in like white supremacist groups, etc. Mm -hmm. If you tell people your race is the most important thing about you, people are going to believe you. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I, I I like to say to my kids, you know, we're Jewish, so I'm like, I don't know, are we white? Like, I, who knows at this? You know, mm -hmm. t today we might be, yesterday we weren't, and so race really doesn't matter. It's who you are, and. I know as cheesy as that sounds, like that's the message we should be delivering to children. It absolutely should be. And also as well, the discrimination against Asian people, particularly when it comes to colleges. Terrible. It's mind boggling. It's going, you can't do this. Right. And it's spiraling past colleges. So the thing is that there are so many books about um, the way the colleges have been this, had this ideology, ideologically captured. Um, but it's happening everywhere now. We have in, in the US, we have these like gifted and talented schools. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to limit how many Asian kids get to go because there's just too many, too many, you know, like the Tiger Moms are doing just too good a job. Um, and it's interesting, like, you know, that they used to limit how many Jews could go to different colleges for this similar reasons. They still do, but to a, a lesser extent. Um, but now you won't even see Jewish kids at these GNT schools because priorities have changed. And, but you will see Russian Jews, and they're, you know, they're pushing the same thing that the Asian parents are, that, the, you know, academics matters a lot, and we expect high things from you, and we want you to work hard. Um, and some, taking this away from people because they have the wrong skin color, because you didn't get the right mix of skin color, is just absurd. How have we got to this place where even something, I mean, that to me is yeah. nuts. The fact that you, li you literally say to someone, Yeah. You pass every every one of our standards, but you can't come in because you're Asian. Right. Well, they, they don't end up saying it to them. So there was a giant scandal in the U.S. Um, a few months ago, like three or four months ago, where there's a school um, in Virginia called the Thomas Jefferson, and it was like the premier gifted and talented mm -hmm. school um, and high Asian population. The principal of several schools didn't tell kids that they had qualified for a National Merit Scholarship because they were embarrassed that the majority of the kids who had qualified were all Asian and there just wasn't a good racial mix. So they didn't tell these kids that they were going to get money for college. It, it's a, it, like To me, that should be a, the huge story even today. It should just be every day. Like They took away something from kids because they were the wrong race. And it was it was a story for a few days. The governor um, passed some rule. A Republican governor passed a rule that now you must tell them what, if they qualified for a national merit scholarship. Like, okay, that's I guess that's something, but it's not really making the kind of changes that we should be making. Well, it's because it's reflecting a much deeper thing that's going on in society, mm -hmm. which is the re-racialization of society, and that that's where we come back to your point about the war on merit. Why would anyone want to wage a war on merit? Right, because it's not fair. Because merit it's not, isn't fair. Merit is not fair. So what is fair? Fair is everybody having the same outcome. That's the, fair. That's well. That's the word that they use. They use equity, right? It's right. not equality. Yeah. Equity is uh, a standardization of outcomes. It's not about how much work you put in. It's everybody comes out the same. I have three kids. They could not be more different. I will be shocked if they end up anywhere near the same uh, with you know outputs. And they're going to have. I'm sure they're all going to do great, but they're going to do great in completely different ways. And if I try to apply the equity standard to them, like you three must all come out virtually the same, it would be a tough, tough haul. Well, Thomas Sowell makes this point a lot, which is how can you possibly expect equity in society when you can't expect equity within right. people who share the same genetic. Right. Base. Right. Um, but th this this is also another thing that reminds me of the Soviet Union. I mean, one of the reasons the Soviet Union collapsed was the the full the terrible productivity that is produced mm -hmm. by a system in which you're not rewarded right. for merit. Yeah. And the impact of that sort of mindset on a society. I mean, you've talked about doctors, and that's a, that's an obvious kind of coal face scenario, but. Everywhere, if if you run a business, by I mean, we saw and we saw it in the UK, you know, with the comedy industry, um, 
Mock the Week, which was a huge TV program, comedy program in the UK, The Mash Report, which I, I worked on for a bit. Uh, a, a bunch of them uh, are basically have died. And a big part of the reason is they, they went uber into sort of left-wing politics instead of doing jokes. Right. Uh, but also, it's, I think it's objective, objectively a fact that they picked people to work on the show based on their demographic characteristics and not on their talent. Right. And those shows don't exist anymore. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to be picked because I'm a woman. No. I, like that was just, I would just find that so insulting. I would want to be the best at whatever it is I'm doing. I don't want to be, you know, oh, we gave the woman a job. Um, <laughs> I, I find that really, you know, um, insulting. And so, again, I, I have a daughter and two sons. I'm teaching them that they all better work and that they have to, you know, produce and, and be at their very best and not just expect doors to open for them you know the sons forget it they're not, nobody's opening any doors but my daughter i'm like you know i'm not waiting for somebody to offer her opportunities just because she's a girl and actually she turned down an opportunity where um there was a she's on a robotics team they didn't make it to states and then she was invited to join another robotics team because they needed a girl and she was like no thanks like i don't want to be the girl on your team what does this do to kids when you effectively say to them it doesn't matter how hard you work you're either going to achieve because you come from a certain ethnic background or you're not going to achieve. I really think it messes them up and and not just, you know, not just about the merit thing, but just in every way if you're told that your accident of birth is all that matters about you and things that you had absolutely no control over is is what's important. Um, I think you you know one of the things that I believe why so many teenagers are non-binary now or you know switching their gender i think it's because they don't have any you know points in the in the oppression meter and they want some so non-binary is a really easy way to get some you don't even need to change anything you just have everybody call you some new pronouns and now you're oppressed now you get to be part of the club and i always say that if this was happening when I was a teenager, no doubt in my mind, you guys would have to be calling me some pronoun you've never <laughs> heard of before. I would, oh, I'd make it up every day. I would have my teachers, I, I can control my what my teachers call me every day. Mm -hmm. Every day I can come in and say I'm something else. Sure, I would do it. Yeah, and- A it, lot of power. And you also think as well, what's gonna happen to this generation when they go into the world of work? Well, we used to think that, and then they went into the world of work, and the world of work conformed to all this nonsense. Right, yeah. And so I don't know. I, I, it's more like, what is the world of work gonna? What's gonna happen to them when, when this new generation who have pronouns that literally we have not heard of yet, um, goes to work? So that's the problem: is that this capture has happened so on so many different levels that mm -hmm. I, I think that these people are running the place. What's interesting is, and we point this out a lot in the book, and really, I, I know I'm a huge bummer usually, but this is like a, my real optimistic point, mm -hmm. is that they're still a real minority. They're just really loud, mm -hmm. and they, they're able to assert their, their, their dominance, and they're able to push the kind of conformity that they require in order for this to work. Um, if people en masse said no, if the Bill Mars and you know the other liberals um, who, who know that this is crazy would be more vocal in pushing back, this could end tomorrow. But people are not brave, they're afraid, they don't want to be called out, they don't want to be ostracized or shunned or called names, and so they don't. And, mm. you know, I think that's going to be step one. Well, one of the, the elements of the book is the idea of erasing innocence. And the thing that I see that makes me want to get the flamethrower out, frankly, is that's a metaphor, by the way. We're no, it's here. fucking literal. <laughs> I want to get the flames. When I see a drag queen in a G-string twerking in front right. of kids, I want to get the flamethrower out. Yeah, I get that because, you know, this, this conversation started with drag queens story hour at your local library. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that a lot of parents at the time were like, oh, what's the big deal? It's like a clown reading to your kids. Like, who cares? Um, and then it spiraled into this G-string thing where when's the last time you saw them read a book to kids? Like it, it, this drag queen story hour has turned into drag queen twerking hour and we're supposed to just accept it. And there's so many examples like that where the slippery slope is just, does not allow for any kind of middle ground. I think that, you know, 
in the past, I would have said like, oh, I'll call people whatever pronoun they, they ask me. But then it went to they, and that's already iffy. And then they went to like, zur, and I don't even know what that is. And now like, there are literally just so many others. I, you can't keep playing this game. It's like, you have to say no early now. And it's, it, it sucks because like, I don't think I cared when Drag Queen Story Hour first hit. I think I thought, you know, who cares? If you want, if parents want to take their kids to this, whatever. But now when I see that, you know, the G-string twerking, I'm like, no, make that illegal right now. And, and where is that coming from? Because I, I don't understand. I, I, I don't, I don't, yeah. I, I'm getting old. I don't understand. <laughs> right. what, why? Why do children need to be uh, exposed to obviously sexualized behavior? Right. I don't care if it's a drag queen. I, I don't care if it's a stripper. I don't care if it's, it's, it's the only metal a drag work queen. teacher. It's right? never going to be a stripper. That's the whole thing. They get, it, they get you or they get other people to say that this is okay through using LGBT, you know, um, community, basically. Right, because if you've got Stormy Daniels to turn exactly. up at a G-string, nobody will be like, no oh, yeah, one, this is important. Right, kids nobody thinks it's okay for a woman to, you know, dance around in six inch heels and a G-string for kids, but a man dressed as a woman becomes okay. And you see this also with pornography in school libraries. That's become a huge thing. What do you mean? What? Do you mean? Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, yeah. No, what no. do you mean pornography in pornography school libraries? Pornography in school libraries has become a giant thing in the U.S. because... What, what do you mean? Parents keep finding pornography in their kids' school library. What, 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 what do you mean by pornography? I mean, you, it would shock you. Not like, not like, you know, I mean, you spread, haven't seen this phone. But no. <laughs> <laughs> just a joke. Um, it's just, um, it's books that literally talk about, uh, show pictures of sex acts. But the sex, Hold on, but yeah. Look, when I was a kid, my yes. parents, when I was a teenager, gave me a book which was educational about sex. Did it have somebody on their knees and giving oral sex? Uh, no. No, no. Right. right. So, no. Um, and did it have, like, sexting in it where two boys sext each other dirty pictures or ask for really graphic things to be sent to them? It didn't. And uh, you would be, again, you would be shocked. And it's happening at elementary schools. So in the U.S., again, that's till fifth grade, that's 11, 12 years old is where elementary school ends. In Florida, Governor DeSantis um, has made, you know, made them go through all the libraries, and this, for this he's called a book banner, and remove a certain, uh, these books that they know that they exist, right? So he sent out, um, so he had a press conference where he was talking about what books they were getting rid of, and he started reading from these books, and news channels had to pull away from his press conference because they can't show that on TV. They can't have that language on but TV. But you can't show that to 10-year-olds. But you can show that to 10-year-olds, and the, the quirk here is it's, always, always a gay story. Because you, you know you can't show straight sex at, at that age to, to kids. But somehow it becomes okay when it's a gay story. And this is how they are able to protect themselves from a lot of criticism. Because, you know, we're just showing LGBT youth, um, you know, stories about them. And this, if you have a problem with this, you're a bigot. Um, Carol, you're not making this up, are you? Swear. I'll, I'll send you, I will, you can, you're, I don't know if you're going to be able to post the pictures, right. but you will be, look up pornography elementary schools, Florida. I, mean, well, I, I, don't, want that, I don't want that in my Google history. But. Uh, Anton's our producer, mate, we're going to do that yeah, on your you, phone. You have a look, mate. <laughs> All right, right. Well, yeah. I hear you. <laughs> but we use the word they, and I think this is really important to yeah. specify. Who are they? There's a lot of these. Um, I know, I know that they, it seems like um, I'm just... I'm calling out some group that doesn't, some shadowy group that doesn't yeah. exist. But there's, it comes from a lot of different places. Um, so one of the examples, again, with one of these pornographic books, um, there, a, a, a 11 year old boy, I think around that age, got up at a school board meeting, started reading from this book. Again, they're all shocked that please stop speaking. That's really disgusting. And they're like, he's like, I got this in my elementary school library. Mm -hmm. He got it from the librarian. The librarian offered him this book and then said, if you like it, I have others like it. Um, yeah, this is, again, happening where it's at every level. We have a, a chapter on libraries and book publishing where, again, super woke, completely ideologically captured and pushing a very specific agenda. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Because if you do, then EasyDNS is a company for you. EasyDNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, 
de-platform attacks or overzealous government agencies. He knows about that. So will you in a second. <laughs> Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and fantastic customer support. They're in your corner no matter what the world throws at you. Unless it's your ex-girlfriend. In which case, you're on your own. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to Easy DNS right now. All you've got to do is go to easydns.com forward slash triggered. That's easydns.com forward slash triggered. Use our promo code, which is also triggered, and get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, which tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. This, and, and I look, I'm looking at it through a UK teacher's yeah. lens and I go back to my training. Mm. This breaks every single safeguarding guideline that I have yes. ever heard, yep. that I've ever heard. Because if someone told me that a boy in my class or a girl, it doesn't matter, was getting se uh, content or books which have sexual connotations mm -hmm. and pornographic, that to me is grooming exactly. and I would have to report it. Well, and if I didn't report it, I would get in problem. I would get in trouble, quite rightly so. It's absolutely grooming. And it's grooming them to not have a perspective on what safety is. Um, not being able to say, this doesn't feel right to me mm. because you're supposed to be okay with all of it. Um, you must see these books because the fact that you haven't you haven't seen these, I, I, I don't know if, again, I would love to hear if uh, this is happening in UK schools once you see like the book titles because they're really common here. It's not like... It's not like two schools found it. It's like dozens and dozens of schools found it just in Florida and in other states, and it, it's it's everywhere. Mm. We we do, sorry, Francis. I just uh, yeah, go to, it, to go follow it, up yeah, on, yeah. on that. We, as far as I mean, I didn't know you had this here. I don't know if we have in the UK. We did have some kind of some a show that was marketed to families with children. It was called, I think, the Family Sex Show. Sex Show, yeah. Family wow. Sex Show, yeah. in which uh, <laughs> the the actors were encouraged at one point to remove items of clothing up to and including full frontal nudity. Mm -hmm. And I, I still remember when we talked about it on the show, the, the lines were, I have a penis in my pants, touch it, touch it, touch <laughs> it. Um, yeah. And wh where is this... Wh where is this... What, why, where, why is this happening? <laughs> why is this happening? I, I right. feel why is it happening? Why is yeah. it happening? Who wants yeah. to, who is it? Look, I'm sorry. In my day, if somebody wanted to sexualize children, we knew what that was, right? We right. had a name for those people and we yeah. tried to arrest them and put them in prison, mm -hmm. right? Why is this happening now in our society? So again, why it's happening is to, it, it, it is to end up with these kids being messed up. I know that that sounds, I know how it sounds. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Who would want to mess up kids? But look, in all these totalitarian societies, that was the goal, to unbalance the family, to make the kids all messed up and make them easier to control. So uh, even though that sounds like something that is crazy, like who would want to harm kids, this is something that has happened throughout history in so many other places. It's just unique that it's happening here and now. Um, and then the idea of removing the kids' barriers and making them more awake, woke to everything that's going on is absolutely part of it. You know, why have kids protest? Why have kids do any of this? Why have kids learn about grown-up topics? It's all to remove, like, the, the barrier of this is not for kids. This is not okay to, to, to do to children. And if you, once you remove that barrier and kids become your little activists who can be, any agenda could be pushed, they're really hard to argue with. Look at the climate, you know, Greta, you, it's impossible to argue with her. It's getting easier as she gets older. Mm. But who was going <laughs> to argue with her when she was like a, you know, adorable little greasy teenager? And it's, we, we have that with gun control in the U.S. too. Like you, the teenagers who speak out, on guns, um, they're impossible to challenge because they're kids and you don't want to argue with children. And this is the thing that ends up happening. Carol, do you think as well, maybe we're projecting a bit too much. I'm not talking about the, the, the pornographic stuff because that's vile. But I'm, I'm talking about the other things. Is it just that these people see that they are, to quote what they always say, on the right side of history? Mm -hmm. And that being the case, it's only right that we teach kids about what it means to be on the right side of history. Yeah. Then the whole kind of indoctrination and mind control. Do people really think that deeply? I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think they do. Yeah. I think the reason this, this uh, ideology is so powerful is it makes you feel good. It makes you feel you're doing the right thing. And if you feel you're doing the right thing and you feel good, then you're going to 
spread it, aren't you? Right, but so which part? Like you're saying the, the drag queens or no, no, not gender the drag ideology. queens. No, not so the drag. I don't drag. know. Right. I, I'm <laughs> willing to believe queens. you. And again, I'm so I'm I'm. But for it, instance, yeah. like with the climate, if you genuinely believe yeah. that the, that we are in a climate yeah, yeah, emergency, yeah, right. then why wouldn't you teach kids? Do you see what but I mean? Why? Why would you teach kids that the Earth might end soon? Like, what are they going to do about it other than not sleep at night? Like, I I I don't know. No, no, they're, they're going to stop using plastic straws. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and when <laughs> yeah. Britain can, you know, I, I love. Yeah. Referring to your speech, yeah. but when it sinks into the sea and nobody cares, like that, it's still not going to make a dent in climate change. Mm. So there's no real purpose of teaching kids about adult issues unless you want them to stress and and, and worry about it because they can't do anything. Again, mm. I can send you my son's you know plan from when he was seven years old and yeah. how we're all going to live in caves, and you that's what they end up coming up with. They're not like. The smartest these seven-year-olds I mean, you know? well right and you know on on this i mean you are right when i was growing up we were also told you know we're about to run out of oil mm -hmm. we're about to run out of coal we're all of these things i don't remember this level of like intensity intensity yeah. anxiety yeah. Mm -hmm. you know oh, uh, that wasn't happening right so, again, had we been having this conversation three years ago, I probably would be with you. Like, mm. nobody thinks about this this deeply. This is crazy. But so much has changed in the last three years where I do think so much of it is willful and it is meant to mess the kids up. And mm. so many of the people in charge or like Randy Weingarten um, is basically runs schools throughout the United States. He's head of the teachers union very powerful, you know, at the Biden White House, got to write COVID policy for whether schools open or not. Not a scientist, obviously, not a doctor. Just got to write policy about whether kids get to go to school. Doesn't have kids, doesn't have any kind of care about kids, and yet she gets to control so much of what happens to children. So do I think it's by design? I, I do at this point. I, it, there's too many coincidences here. I think a lot of the, you know, you were saying about... Um, the grooming and whatever there's other ways not just sexual grooming but to groom them to accept different ideas and to be able to immediately uh, convince them of things there's another kind of grooming it's uh, intellectual grooming but that's what's happening also making them believe that this set of ideas is the only set of ideas allowed and and this is what we're going to push to you yeah and I look and, and I think that's a problem plus as well you know one of the great tragedies about education is that education rapidly becomes political because adults are political. Mm -hmm. And unless they have a real discipline, they bring politics into the classroom. And the problem is with doing that is kids, they, can't, they don't yet have the capacity to take on an idea, yeah. to break it down, to, right. look, uh, to analyze strengths and weaknesses, unless you teach them that. And that's another part of the problem is that we don't teach critical thinking in schools. Absolutely, because you're not allowed to. Why, why would we allow critical thinking in schools when we need them to believe certain things that we're telling them? Um, I, we do a lot of critical thinking stuff at home. Um, for us, it's really important that my kids can identify when somebody's trying to convince them of something. Um, and, and so my older two, you know, my youngest is seven. He doesn't count yet. But my older two <laughs> are... are Really, they're woke police. They are like, wait, I heard something. Is this something? And, and often they're right. Um, mm. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I'm like, no, it's fine. Don't worry about that. Um, but they, they're they very careful about what, what gets told to them. And I let, you know, again, my co-author protects her kids from all media. My kids are on YouTube. They're watching stuff. And what I end up discovering is that, like, they, because I let them watch whatever they want, they end up watching the world's most wholesome stuff. They are just, like, the Mormon channel. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, this Mormon comedy skit with no cursing at all or, you know, <laughs> bad themes is, is what my kids watch. Uh, and, Carol, uh, if people want more on that, I really recommend they read the book Stolen Youth. But I, before we wrap up, uh, uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes... I mean, the COVID policies managed to achieve something that's very difficult, which is to get some New York Jews to move out. <laughs> <laughs> right? that, that used to right. be pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, what happened? Well, for us, um, it was really what about around schools, um, that the schools were closed, only the public schools, which is the yeah, public schools in Britain, I know, mean private schools. Yeah. But yeah. here, like our local schools were closed. But if you paid fifty to $70,000 to go to private school in New York City, your schools were open because they were COVID safe. Um, and the thing was that our neighbors had spent that summer of 2020, we lived in a very left neighborhood, which never mattered. It was fine. We didn't care at all. It was like, yeah, we were open conservatives. We had friends, uh, you know, which we still do. Um, but 
It never mattered until then, where we watched them march for equity and then not say one word when the poorest kids in the city couldn't get help, couldn't go to school, didn't get to, you know, they, the, my neighbors hired for their own kids tutors or they formed pods or they moved to their beach house and sent the kids to school there. And they didn't speak up at all for the kids all around the city. I grew up really poor in Brooklyn, you know, in the immigrant story. And so all of my kids, from um, all my friends from childhood were are blue collar workers who mm. didn't get to like sit at home and order Uber Eats during the pandemic and treat it like a little vacation. And I saw that nobody cared about them at all. And the New York that I had always loved was one that when bad things happened to us, we joined together and we, you know, 9-11 happens, we become the world's most patriotic city or we had a blackout in 2003. We ended up, you know, helping each other, old ladies, you know, would just, people would bring them food or we, we really do step up. The Superstorm Sandy was another one. We had a major hurricane and power was out throughout most of the city and people really helped each other. And this was the first moment that I was like, these assholes, <laughs> like, didn't want to help anybody, didn't do anything at all, um, took care of their own kids, all while marching for equity in the streets, like liars. And I could never unsee that. And that was the what really pushed us out the door. It was a lot of things were going right in Florida. Governor DeSantis, I think, did an amazing job on COVID, but on so much more. Um, and I, I, we liked the way the di direction Florida was going, and we wanted to be somewhere sane for the first time in our lives. And one of the things about New York, Francis and I were there last year, we'll mm -hmm. be back there very soon again. Um, and it's not just New York, because the same thing is the case in Nashville, the same thing to an even larger extent is the case in LA, and this is what we've seen with our own eyes, and I know San Francisco is even worse. I mean, for people who haven't been to New York lately, I'm not exaggerating when I say you walk out of the door and in quite a lot of parts of New York, I mean, it is literally a human zoo now. Right. In terms of like homeless people with mm -hmm. no clothes on the street. We were driving, we went to pick a parcel up in, in DC and we had to go out of like the main pretty bit in the center and we were, we were in, a, in, a, in a cab somewhere. And we were stopped at a traffic light and there was a guy lying there with no shirt on and I said to I said to our producer, I said, "Do you think he's all right?" And and the, and, yeah, and Anton went, uh, "I would go with no." But <laughs> you you literally have in the the most powerful wealthiest country in the world, hundreds of people in major cities lying around in the street because they're addicted to drugs right. or whatever, like. How is that happening in, in, in this country? So I would tie this all back to wokeness because, again, I grew up in, in 1980s Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Things were really bad. Crime was worse than it is now. Um, mm -hmm. But it had been bad for a long time. And the, the difference that I always like to point out is that nobody in 1980s Brooklyn was saying, like, oh, this isn't that bad. Look at, these, <laughs> look at the numbers from the 1970s. Like, we are doing so much better than we were doing 10 years ago. But now it's like a... a giant ask to get people to admit that crime is bad, that crime is bad, that crime is happening, that homelessness is bad, that homelessness is happening. It's very like, what are you talking about? Look at the 1980s. It was so much worse back then. But who cares? Who cares that it was worse back then? Then we had the, you know, years and years of New York being the most amazing place to be. And that's the thing. I was so into New York and I was so defensive of New York because it was great. It was a great place to be in my 20s. It was a great place for us to have our kids in my 30s. And then now it's like you can't admit that there's a problem. And that, again, is step one. And you can't admit there's a problem because wokeness says that you're not supposed to notice that these policies have led to this outcome and that it's only happening really primarily in blue areas. Look, Miami has problems. I'm not saying it's not Dallas, you know, Houston. All cities have problems, but at least they like admit these are problems worth fighting or challenging or, or doing something about. In New York, they can't get to that first step of like, this is a problem, let's do something about it. Do you think we spend far too much time talking about other things and not enough time talking about these things? Um, I mean, I, I feel like we talk about a lot of, about crime in the U.S. Um, because, and, the, and the homeless issue because places that are doing crazy things like legalizing drug use out in the open are seeing obviously an increase in both drug use and homelessness and also crime. Um, and in the U.S. we do talk about like, look, your policies are leading to bad outcomes. And it's like, no, but these policies are equitable. So this is this is what we're going to be doing now. Um, 
So we do talk about it a lot. It's not like this isn't a topic that gets covered a lot. It gets dismissed as right wing, you know, mm -hmm. paranoia. And if you notice that things are bad and things are, um, and I watched this happen to liberals in my very leftist neighborhood in Brooklyn, where if they said they were worried about crime, they'd get it on Facebook in a you know group or whatever. They'd get hundreds of comments like, "What crime? What are you talking about? What are you like? Put away your MAGA hat." <laughs> you don't have to be ideological. Just walking around New York. Yeah. You, you you are literally confronted with with human misery. On right. a, it's not that you go, oh, these people are smelly. Get get the plebs away from me. You're going like right. these people are in distress. And ten years ago, this wasn't the case. Absolutely. Which is really what the the point is. Like it wasn't like this. It wasn't like this for a long time. Right. It was eight years of Rudy Giuliani followed by twelve years of Michael Bloomberg and even the first term of um, Eric Adams. No, no, um, De Blasio, oh, Mayor right. Bill De Blasio. We were coasting because even though he's like a super leftist and his ideas are really stupid, it, things were so good for so long that New York was just like mm. free, free rolling basically and then that ended and it's gonna take a long time and a lot of work to get back to that place and I don't know that New Yorkers want it. I think that they keep voting for policies that don't do that. They don't solve any of these issues. When is the pendulum going to swing back? Because the reality is it has, it has to. to. You, you, you can't have, you know, policies like, oh, if somebody steals something, as long as it's not the, I, I'm not sure if New York has it. $999.99, $99, then it's not a crime. You go, this can't carry on. This is literally unsustainable. Right. And these businesses keep leaving these areas. Um, mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. like a uh, major retailer, REI, just left Portland. Mm -hmm. REI is like hiking gear. Basically, everybody in Portland wears I REI from, from head to toe. And that giant business has left Portland because they're just getting robbed all the time. And it's become an issue. You know, they, they don't really like that. Um, so, yeah, it has to stop. And just the migration levels in the U.S., like the fact that people are moving to places like Florida and Texas at such a high rate. Um, last year in 2022, the year that we moved, we were two of 36,000 just New Yorkers who mm. moved from New York to Florida. And that number is way higher than, you know, just New Yorkers. So it's, it's happening. People are making changes. And I, I don't know. I, I do see the pendulum swinging because it absolutely has to. But, you know, you never know. Communism lasted a long time. It wasn't like they didn't know it wasn't working. They did. But it, it still managed to, to keep on keeping on for decades. So I hope it changes in my lifetime. I hope my kids don't grow up in the insanity that we are living in right now. I'm kind of, I feel lucky that they're young and I still have a few years of, you know, getting them ready to be in college and be around the woke idiots and, you know, et cetera. All right. Well, there's a note of optimism. <laughs> this may or may not end in the next few decades. There you go. Carol Marcus recommends you so stolen youth to everybody. Uh, where can people find you online and follow your work? On Twitter, I'm just at K-A-R-O-L. I, um, at my pinned tweet has a newsletter where I send out everything I'm up to. And uh, that's really it. Perfect. Well, uh, we're going to ask you a few questions from our local supporters yeah. that they will only get to see on our Locals page. So uh, follow us over there. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you on Locals very shortly. You've written that parents should tell their children that marriage is as important, if not more important than money in a career. Why do you think parents are giving the opposite message to their children? Is there anything social or government policy can or should do to encourage and support the formation and continuation of stable families?